Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Uh, the whale will jump up right when I'm talking and that sort of thing. So we are going to record this, I think, uh, which is nice because I want as many people to know about it as possible. And so I'm really grateful to Pastor Is to allow me to come and be at Amazing Grace. Now, Amazing Grace is such a neat word, a neat name for a church because uh, when I was eight years old, God's Amazing Grace touched my life and I've been born again ever since and but a lot of you may not have had the same opportunity so maybe your amazing grace opportunity came later and maybe it hasn't come yet well a lot of people in other countries they've never even heard of jesus christ they've never heard of his love or his amazing grace so this is your opportunity to touch one life with one simple gift and uh we have i've brought about uh, well, en- enough boxes for each of you to have at least one, and if you want ten, I can supply you ten. But uh, we're going to be passing around this brochure. They say if you hear something, you remember a certain amount. If you see it and hear it, you remember more. But if you see it, hear it, feel it, and touch it, you remember it quite a bit more. So we're passing out one of these brochures to each and every one of you. If you open it up, you'll see that uh, what you can put inside this box. Now let me explain what the box does uh, by giving you an example. Uh, probably one of the most profound stories I've ever heard about Operation Christmas Child was from a, a gentleman. Whoops. Uh, I don't worry about that. That happens when you're on the beach. Yeah. Hand it to Sharon. She'll hold it up for you. Uh, <laughs> Sharon's gonna. I'm gonna ask her to come in uh, just a minute and tell what she's putting in her boxes because she came up and said, "I I do this." All right. And I enjoy doing this. And she told me all the things she put in her boxes, so I'll let her do that. But uh, one time uh, a few years back in Africa, they were gonna give distribute shoe boxes, and what we Samaritans Purse does is they select a church that they know is is a good church someone that's really doing a good work and so this boy several days away heard about the fact that they were going to give out christmas presents to children all you had to do is get there this little boy had a had a bum foot and it was uh and he was crippled but so he had him and his mother walk two and a half days through the jungle to get to this place where they were going to give out uh, Christmas shoe boxes. Now, he didn't know what it was all about. He has heard that they were going to give Christmas presents. He had never had a present, much less a Christmas present. He did not know what a Christmas present was or what it was for. So he walks all the way, gets there, and they had all the children sit down, and they gave everybody a box. And they were looking around, and he didn't have a box yet. And they said, well, there is one that was kind of beat up in the back. So we'll give him that box. So he, everybody on the count of three opened their box and kids were just screaming because they, they had toothbrushes in there that they'd never even seen a toothbrush. They had toys, they had clothes, all sorts of things, school supplies where they could learn and read and write. And this little boy opened his present and inside was orthopedic shoes. His size, I imagine. His size. <laughs> and the story comes back. They, they figured out who gave it, and it was an orthopedic surgeon who didn't know what to put in his box, so he just put these shoes in there. God got that right special box, box to, the right to the right kid. Now, that's just one story. Another story, a pastor came just recently and was talking to different churches and uh, who are involved with Operation Christmas Child every year, and we hope... Uh, Amazing Grace will choose to be involved every year because this is such a profound uh, ministry. The pastor came and he was a little boy. He had never, his family was so poor, they never even gave a, a gift. They, at Christmas time, the kids would have to stay inside because they were, all the other children were running around and playing with their Christmas toys and things. But they had to stay inside because they never got a Christmas present. Well, one time in their community, in their village, 
uh, a church was going to give out all the shoe boxes with all the, the presents. And so he was able to go. Now, he was, I think, about seven years old, and he had brothers, and he had friends, and they were all, they all knew each other in that small village. He went there, got the shoe box, opened it up, and then what they do is they have a 12-lesson uh, discipleship class where they teach the children the greatest journey, and each, each kid gets a, uh, uh, a study lesson. There's 12 lessons in here. And at the end of that, when they complete that, they get a free Bible in their own language. And the story goes that about seven to eight people get saved just from one shoebox. The kid takes it back. He shares with mom and dad, shares with his brothers and sisters, that sort of thing. So it's so powerful. Now you're thinking, well, I may not have much money to, to go and buy school supplies or toothbrushes and that sort of thing but you know what uh there are processing centers where if you grab a box take it put in something that that go to go shopping and find something on sale don't buy anything extravagant because these kids don't know what extravagant is put it in and if you can only put a pencil in there don't worry about it because when it gets to the processing center people have donated and we'll fill it up so is that fair if you have t uh, seven dollars then put seven dollars in that helps to pay for the shipping uh for each box but if you tried to go to the post office and mail this box to nepal it would cost you 50 to 75 dollars probably so seven bucks if you don't have the seven bucks don't worry about that we have someone that's going to give money and they'll pay for that so uh, i'd like you sure ship a to whole come. container right Entire yeah we, container. we shipped out uh from hawaii last year four full 40-foot containers of shoeboxes. Shoe boxes. All right. So over 35,000 of these this year went to Nepal. And in, right in those areas, if you've been reading and uh, watching the news, you know they had dramatic earthquakes. A lot of people died from Nepal. And, and uh, a lot of those people that died went to heaven because, you know, they had heard and they got a simple little shoebox. So today you can take your brochure I come and get a box take it home pray about what to put in you can decide to go boy or girl in what age there's three different age groups and you can pick and choose which one Sharon why don't you come up and uh, just say what, uh, what what did you put in your shoe box uh, this year already she's already done it so oh, you're done already hello I'm go ahead Sharon okay. talk um, turn it towards you like an ice cream cone there you go. Thank yeah, you. there you go. See, I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> she's not a public speaker, but that's all right. Yeah. She's a good bo box packer. That's yeah. right. I am. Um, I was, saw it on Facebook, actually. I saw two videos. One was um, when your children are not... Is that good? Okay. When your children are not exactly happy with what they get for Christmas, and they showed a video of all these children who get little boxes like these, and they're just ecstatic. So... I went shopping and it's so, my box is overflowing, it, so I'm going to need a couple. Yeah. It's really easy, I mean I put combs, um, the first thing I did was find a toy and it's, it's a stuffed bear that can get wet or dry, it's a really cool little thing, but then I have a jump rope and pencils and paper and a coloring nice. book and crayons and combs and bows for their what hair. What do you mean combs? I kind of went after my... Um, what, what is a cone? A what? Comb. Combs. Comb. Combs. That she said a cone. I'm like, what is a cone? <laughs> What's a cone? So Ice cream cone? cone? So funny, this one no. girl from uh, Russia, she got a toothbrush, and she had never seen a toothbrush. She had just, she already planned to commit suicide, her and her little brother, oh. because they were they had nothing. They had, someone had given them a present a year or so earlier, uh, but it was they did not share the gospel. So this time she went over to get her box. And this time, she said, okay, God, if you're real, rather than committing suicide, I'm going to trust you. Well, she gets her shoebox. Inside was a toothbrush. Well, of course, over there, with, with all the lice and everything, they shave your head, right? So she had a little bit of hair. She thought it was a brush, a hairbrush. So she's combing her, her short hair with a toothbrush because she had never seen one. That same afternoon... She was called into the office, and uh, the people there said, uh, we have good news for you. And she said, what is that? She said, uh, you've been adopted. Wow. 
same day. And she said, well, what about my little brother? Uh, don't worry, he, he, they've adopted both of you. All right. She today, oh, it's so cool, it was adopted by a, a Baptist pastor and his wife in Dallas, Texas. She's got the most awesome Texas accent. <laughs> it's so cool. girl with a Texas accent. And she's actually in business today, and she's on LinkedIn and everything. She's, uh, her whole life changed rather than committing suicide. Her life changed and so in a Basically. powerful way. So that's what one simple box will do, okay? Is anybody willing to do this that you wouldn't mind doing it? Could we just hand them out to you right now? Dave, would you yeah. mind going yeah. and we Sharon, can. would you help hand okay. out the boxes? And... Uh, because we got them yeah. right here. I just as soon get everyone set up with it and send you to have a... You so can take here's, here's a... You know, if you want when, one of when these... When you're done with it, where they want to know what do they do. Should okay. bring them back to me or to you? How yeah. we'll, we'll arrange? Okay. Living Stones is the relay center for the whole uh, West Coast. All right. Now, if you want to bring it back here, I will, all, he, all Pastor has to do is call me. I'll come pick them up, and I'll deliver them to Living Stones. If you want one of these cool ones that you can fold yourself, that you can do that, and you can Follow fold it in just a few minutes. So that's pretty cool. So everyone get a box, at least one. And if you want, you can also drop it to Living Stones, Absolutely, correct? yeah. And, uh, you guys know where that is on Ali'i Drive about halfway down? Yes, y you have about two weeks to do that. Uh, oh, by the way, don't put any guns, <laughs> don't put any Hershey bars that's going to melt everything and ruin it. Yeah. You said gum, <laughs> not, not gun. <laughs> guns. No toy guns. Yeah, yeah. So if you read the brochure, it'll tell you what to put in. Okay. So I, I just want to thank God and, and also thank Pastor for letting me come oh, and no share worry. because Glad I believe you. this will change not only your life but uh, someone else's life. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? Do you have a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> David will be around. If, are you going to be around afterwards? Yeah. Okay, yeah. he'll be around afterwards if you have any questions. Yeah. And uh, you can you so coordinate much. with yeah. him. And, or you have other friends you know would be interested yeah. in him coming to share. Uh, maybe you're a school teacher and you want to mm -hmm. have your class do this yeah. to get them involved in helping others. We want to um, we want to give a chance for, you know, all the different avenues that the Lord might use to uh, get the gospel out. And we're really grateful for this work, what they've done in Samaritan's Purse. So, this is, how many of you heard of this already? You know, this has been going on for a long time. And, um, well, 10 million boxes went out last year. That's a huge opportunity for the gospel, guys. So, we want to just be part of what God's doing. We're just a small church in, on a beach in Hawaii, but we can all be part of what the Lord is doing. So, would you guys join me? Let's kind of, uh, Aaron, would you pray for us this morning and, and pray for our time in the Word? Shall we do that together? And Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and we ask for your blessings um, on this Christmas project to pray that this would touch many lives. Um, and it's, Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be a part of that. But Lord, it's your, you've got the power behind it. So just pray your blessing be upon that, that you touch people's lives. And now, Lord, we pray that you would touch our lives, that you would uh, use Pastor Izzy to speak to us, to... Um, Help us to learn more about who you are and how much you love us. Mm -hmm. Pray, Lord, that just like you send that breeze right now to refresh us, pray that you would fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Pray, Lord, that you would fulfill us and, and, uh, and equip us for this coming week for any challenges and opportunities that you have for us. We ask that now, and we also ask that you uh, bless Pastor Izzy's surgery tomorrow. Just pray for quick healing. Uh, mm -hmm. Give the surgeons and the, and the staff and the and the nurses and everybody, uh, skill and compassion. Lord, most of all, we pray for your, your healing hand upon him. We ask that now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't worry, it's not a heavy thing. I just have a, thi a little cyst. Um, I have a tooth that never grew in. And now, now that I'm older, they said that that's, that sack that the tooth is supposed to form in has filled up with blood or something and is, it needs to be removed. And so they're going to cut it. And I'm kind of grateful because it kind of plugs up my nose on this side. And so hopefully that will, like, let me get some air. Uh, so it's, I'm really fond of breathing. It's a strange thing, you know. Just, it, you, you don't realize how much you miss it till you're stuffed up real bad. And, uh, you know, so I'm praying that somehow through this it will give me a little bit better, uh, you know, sleep at night. Because it does, it does make me have to sleep sitting up in a chair often uh, or, you know, lean back in my little chair. I can't lay all the way down and get all plugged up. 
So I'm very grateful. I covet all your prayers. More than that, I covet your prayers for what we're trying to do in our new um, am, uh, ambitions in the ministry with um, our sister I shared with you last week uh, about Dylan videotaping the sermon for the first time. He did a great job, made a little intro and exit, posted it on YouTube, and, and we shared it on Facebook. Had um, 464 likes, it was, in, uh, in about 12 hours, um, just on Facebook, and another 58 views uh, th at that same time on YouTube. Now, I didn't do it right. You're supposed to share it on YouTube and, and Facebook, make them go over there to watch it, but whatever, we're new, figuring it all out, so uh, it's okay. But... Um, the exciting part is just that there's that many. I, I, got the, I got the joy of hearing from people I led to Christ 30, 35 years ago. And they were so excited to see us, you know, sharing the gospel. To them, we're missionaries going way out to the uttermost parts of the earth. You don't realize, but from the Jewish, yes, yeah, suffering in Hawaii. But to the Jewish perspective, you know, Jesus said that, the, that you are to be my witnesses first in Jerusalem. Then in Judea, which is the region, you know, just if you think of a pebble in a pond, first splash down is Jerusalem, where the gospel would be introduced. But then the next ring out would be Samaria, the, the regions reaching out around Jerusalem. And then what do he say? Jerusalem, Judea, and the remotest parts of the earth. Now, to the Jewish mindset, we are, from Israel's perspective, we're 12 hours time difference from them. It's easy when it's hard when you travel there because you get wicked, you know, uh, kind of your days and nights mixed up. You, you leave here, you know, at seven in the morning, you do all this 17 hours of flying. You arrive there. Your body thinks I should be kind of in the middle of the night and it's day because you're, you're 12 hours time difference from where you've left. And it um, takes a little readjust on the way back, too. It's kind of unless you want people to sleep on planes, then you then you do all right. If you cannot. It's a little rough on the transit, but it's worth it. You get to see all the stuff where the Lord... But to the Jew, we are, in their minds, at the remotest place on the earth away from Jerusalem. So I feel like we get the privilege to be a light for the Lord and, and fulfill that great commission to be a witness all the way to the remotest region. We're the remotest piece of land from any other pieces of land, you know, continents on the whole of the globe. So... God gave us a, a, a unique opportunity to be a light for him. Now, I was sharing with David about, um, about how the Lord has let us be a light in these islands, how we, 20, what was it, 1992, 20 some, 24 years ago, we started working on starting CSN uh, radio station, the, uh, the Christian Satellite Network. It's called Calv Calvary Satellite Network. And we ha and also the Effect Radio. We spent nine years fighting with the FCC to make Christian radio st uh, s stations through the outer islands. There was already one in, in Honolulu. Our dear brother, uh, Bill Stonebreaker at Calvary Chapel, Honolulu, had pioneered to work there. And we came in and started making, you know, satellite uh, things for repeater stations for the gospel here. And man, did I take some of the worst hits I've ever taken in the ministry. You would not believe how many attacks I, I personally came under just because, you know, when you try to share the gospel with more and more people, does the devil stand up and give you applause? Yay, good job. Keep it up. No. He goes, I'm going to take you out, you know, and he does whatever he can to mess with you. And, and I've had some of the weirdest things. But it seems that, you know, we had attacks when we did that. Then we got asked to do the radio programming, to take these little sermons we do on the beach and put them on the radio. And then I took more attacks. And then... Then we went to, you know, the, uh, oh, the hard one, iTunes. Try to get a sermon in iTunes. That took a while. We finally got through the hurdles of that. We got it working, the podcasting and all the, you know, you can subscribe and you can have it download to your device. And, and I thought, okay, I'm done. Let's just go back to just stay to preaching. And then the kids say, but, but you need to be on YouTube and uh, with a video. I, I haven't, just those of you who know me. I am not ambitious for um, self-promotion. I think that's one of the biggest traps in our society, is men promoting themselves. Now, I am very big on pre preaching the gospel, though. So I am full out to anything that would get the gospel in any way to reach more people. Just like participating with Samaritan's Purse, we get to help be a small part of promoting Jesus to these kids all around the world. I mean, that's a, what a privilege that is.
Okay, and, and, and I'm all for promoting our Lord. So last week we, we did our first video. Woo! You know, I sat here guarding my microphone. Like my daughter Joy watched it. She was so happy. She said, Dad, I'm so glad you guys did. I miss you. so." She's in North Carolina where her husband's stationed in the military. And so she's like, oh, I got to sit there. And, you know, because she sat where you are looking at this and listening to me teach most of her life. And so she just loved it. She goes, and I like how you covered up the, the microphone with, from the wind. I saw you put your Bible up on your shoulder just at the right time when it got windy. And I said, yeah, that's the radio guys got me to do that because they wanted to build this big shield around me. I said, no way. I mean, I need the breeze. I need it to blow. And uh, so I'm getting better at these things. If I don't look over to your side too much today, it's not because I don't love you guys over here. It's because the breeze is coming this way and it's blowing on my mic. So I get to concentrate on you guys, Phaedra, our dear sister, and Mark, and those guys over here, this section. And I'm blocking the wind. And the crazy stuff you have to do for these um, technologies. But is it worth it if we reach another soul with the gospel? Absolutely. And I'm so excited because I'm praying that the efforts that we do will, we, we started, we actually this week, I should give Dylan here, D Dylan stand up right there, this young man with the blue hat. He worked so hard to make, uh, we have now an Amazing Grace YouTube channel and we'll be posting the videos to that and, uh, and then we'll share it. And if, you ha if you're one of those people who already know how to do all this stuff, would you help me by, you know, doing the thumbs up, like it and, and, and share it. Share it. If you have a, if you have people that would be interested in the, hearing the gospel, please share it to them, especially if you know it, I will have a chance to maybe share it to you, their friend who needs the gospel or any way to promote Jesus. This is what we're after. We're trying to teach people that sweet gift God gave of his son. So, so it says that so whosoever believes in him would not perish but have what? Everlasting life. That's what we're, we're here to promote people coming to everlasting life. That gift, what God wants to give them. So, so if you are good with those technologies, you like doing your smartphone or your computer, click on it for me. Um, we'll put this video. We, we're just working on the bugs and getting all the you know, little stuff that has to work on it. And, um, but we're trying to do it. And I'm excited. 464 views were done in the first like 12 or 16 hours on Facebook and, uh, and another 58 over on the on the YouTube and I don't I'm not a YouTube guy so I had this is like a new splash you know and um, so we'll try to see if we can do it right and maybe we could get reach a lot of people yes to the thing okay th did you hear that guys if everyone could hit the subscribe to the amazing grace YouTube channel yeah, they see that people subscribe, and it pushes you to... I don't know if you've ever watched YouTube, but when you're watching a video, on the side, there's these suggested videos. The way to get to the top of that suggested list is to have a bunch of people subscribing to your thing. Okay, Because so, if it's something related, if they, like last week, we put the title, Galatians 3, Who Has Bewitched You? You know, you've, and, and, uh, and because of the title, right next to me was another pastor teaching Galatians 3 at the top. And then I noticed if I clicked on his video, my video went next on the thing, you know. And we want to kind of make it where, it, you know, because people aren't going to look 35 slots down normally to listen to your thing. So we want to get a bunch of people to subscribe and push it to the top and let people hear the gospel. You know, we'll see what the Lord will do. I know iTunes has opened up a lot of doors for people to be able to hear all around the world. It, it works on their devices all around. And it, even though it was hard to get through those hoops, it, it was worth it. So bear with us. We're just going to smooth it out. Um, if you don't want to be in the video at all, um, don't sit where Sharon is because, well, they get to see the back of her head. And, and uh, uh, you, we can. We got it aimed now. We've just moved it a little. So we're going we're gonna to do the best we can. Now pray for whales because I'm tired of telling the radio guys we really have whales. I want video proof. So while I'm preaching, if a whale blows, just tap Dylan to have him pan over and they can watch and, uh, and we'll just show them that we're, this is the wallpaper what the Lord has given us. This is, this is a beautiful place to see God's handiwork. Now we do not worship whales. We do not worship any of creation. The Bible says don't make that mistake of worshiping the creation. Rather worship the create what? Tor. We worship the maker of all things. But his handiwork it says in the Psalms is 
it, it, it is, it, it, his, it, it, his handiwork is evident in all what he has created. You look at all the marvelous things the Lord has made, and you go, what a great God we have. What an awesome God. So this morning, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Galatians. We're out of the way to chapter 4. If you would turn to Galatians chapter 4 this morning, we saw last week that Paul had explained that because of the law, all men became shut up in their sin. In other words, you read the Old Testament rules, you're bound to have broken at least one. So they're not one of us can stand up and say, I'm righteous according to the law. No, the law, Paul says, became our tutor to teach us we have a spiritual problem. This spiritual condition called sin that all men are affected by. But the answer to that sin would come through the gift of God through his son Jesus. And Jesus it says, though sin entered the world through one man, the first Adam, in one of the discourses we read, another, another one of the New Testament epistles says that through one man, sin entered the world, through Adam, the first Adam. But life, that through that sin also, what's the wages of sin? I forgot to mention, it's what? Death. But then life came to the second Adam, that second Adam being Jesus. And he came to cover that death. And so this is what we're celebrating. Now, Paul says the law did its job. But before the law was ever given, we studied this last week, what covenant was given to Abraham? Do you remember God said to Abraham, I'm going to do these certain things. I'm going to bless all nations through you, all nations through you. And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as what? Righteousness. Did he follow the Ten Commandments? No, because they weren't even around. The, this, is, this is a covenant God made before the law was ever given through Moses. Abraham, by the way, is before Moses. Abraham will have Isaac, his son. Isaac will have Jacob, who gets, wrestles with the angel, gets his name changed to Israel, or we say Israel in English. And then he'll have 12 sons, and one of those sons will be Levi. And though that, that particular tribe of the 12 sons of, of Israel, the Levites, will become the Levitical priesthood. And Moses and Aaron will be born into that lineage. So just to give you an idea, Abraham is way before the law. Now, in God's, if God makes a, a contract with man, with a man like Abraham says, I count that as righteousness. You believe me, you're done. You're in. And this rules come along later. Does the rules invalidate the covenant that God made? No. And that's what Paul was trying to point out because there was a really strange thing. And I hate to say this. It still goes on today. Where for some reason men like to kind of add extra rules to the complete work what God already accomplished in his covenant with man. Abraham has a cool title in the New Testament. And actually, by the way, over in Israel, he also carries this title. This is where we get it. He's called the father of the what? Of the faith. Did he have to follow the Ten Commandments to be the father of the faith? No, because they weren't given. He was the father of the faith simply because he had what? Faith. And we read, for those of you who have been coming to Tuesday night. Now, I know this week I won't be doing that because of the surgery, but, but we'll pick up there again the following week. But in Ephesians chapter 2, that famous verse, you are saved, is by grace you are saved through what? Through faith. Not through following the Ten Commandments, through faith. And it is not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a, it's a gift of God, a free gift. And the only thing you can do when you're offered a gift, just like these Christmas boxes that will be given out, to those kids, do they say, you must now do, obey these Ten Commandments to get these? But no. When they say, here's a gift, you know how fast those kids snatch those boxes? We should, the Bible said, unless we become like little children, unless we be like a child, when it comes to the spiritual things that God wants to grant us, he says we can't receive the things of the kingdom of heaven. God goes, I got a gift for you. I want to give it to you. What do we have to do? Take it. Accept it. You know, but some of us are adults. What do I have to do? Work for it? What's the catch? How much is it going to cost? You know, what's the little things... Uh, I got news for you. You need to be more childlike. 
Just think back when you were a kid and someone was offering you something and you just snagged it. Because when God says, I want to give you everlasting life. Guys, I'm, I'm not going to say that all of the Christian history that has come before us has been a good witness of what Jesus did. Because a lot of men have crept in and the very same thing what happened at Galatia, what Paul wrote this letter to address, that this whole thing, he called it a bewitching. Remember Galatians 3, 1, it says, who has bewitched you? Who has, you know, cast a spell over you and made you think that somehow by, by doing works for God, you become more approved, more spiritual. He, he asked him, did you receive the Spirit of God by works or by hearing and by and through that hearing came what it says faith co comes by what hearing and hearing by the word of God when you heard and you believed God said here's my spirit and his spirit will be with you he'll lead you he'll guide you he will he will direct you he'll convict you when you're doing something wrong you know when some people say to me how do you know that there's a God <clears throat> if I'm really honest when I start to be tempted to do something I shouldn't do. And there's this voice. Now, I don't mean an audible, you know, voice comes out of a speaker from heaven. Izzy, don't do that. No, no, no. It's more personal than that. There's this voice inside. And I know it's not my voice. The, the kids were asking me, how do you know when it's God speaking to you whether it, or, or it's you? I said, I'm pretty sure it's God when he's telling me not to sin. Me part voice is saying, yeah, do it. It looks good, you know. Because, you know, the Bible says sin appears good for a season. You know, it, 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 by the way, the devil does not present sin in an ugly wrapped package. He makes it all glittery on the outside. He doesn't say death is inside, you know. This will kill you. But he makes it look really nice and fun and just participate in this and you'll be... Oh, man, you're going to be popular or you're going to be wonderful. He's, he's full of baloney. But, but my fleshly part of my being can be drawn toward that sin. And when there's those temptations, have any of you can give an amen that, that you actually have experienced? You have a temptation right in front of you and there's something saying, mm -mm -mm -mm. and I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be a voice. There's a, it's even deeper than a voice. It's that inner spirit that just says, stop. Do not proceed. Danger. You know, warning Will Robinson for you guys that watched Lost in Space. Danger, danger. I mean, the spirit of God is real for every person. And when people say, prove that there's a God, I'm like, have, it, have you ever, raise your hand if you've ever experienced what I'm talking about. You're about to be tempted to do something and something inside you saying, don't do it. And you know it's not you that said don't do it, okay? Raise your hand if you ever experienced that. Just want you to look around now. If, if what I'm talking about isn't real, how come all these other people have felt God do it to them? God is personal. And Paul, seeing what was happening in the church of Galatia, they're creeping in. These fellows that were adding to this simple... They, 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 were, they were polluting the very simplicity of salvation, the gift that God wants to give. Do I have a whale behind me? A school of dolphins, that's good. All right. Zoom over there, would you, Dylan? So, which way? Left side of the rock? Left side. Oh, right over here. Tails and stuff. Come on, jump, you guys. It's, it's good for the sermon for the guys that watch this. I, okay, look, keep your eye over there, but listen to me, okay? This is a new church experience for some of you, you know. My veterans do this really well. They, they're like used to it. They just enjoy the wallpaper. And, and he, my son Daniel is an auditory learner. He can sit and watch the dolphins the whole time, but he still hears what I'm saying. So, so I know some of you can do this. Just, just enjoy what the Lord has made. But I love that this, we have living wallpaper. I, I hear in the mainland they project images on the wall behind the, the past. I got the real thing. This is not blue screen, by the way, or what do they call green screen? And this is not green screen for you guys that watching on the mainland. That's really the beach. 
and we really baptized right there in the Keiki Pond, right over there. And uh, in fact, um, she didn't come this morning, but sh there's a gal asking to be baptized, and possibly Phaedra will get baptized with her. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a celebration coming up pretty soon. So it's good. It's so cool to share Jesus, and then just where's your baptismal font? Oh, right over there. And I got a big one, and uh, never run out of water. So uh, so it, it's a privilege. Now these guys at Galatia, they were being. Someone was trying to make a spell cast over them. They were coming in and saying, you get the Spirit of God by doing certain steps, certain works. And Paul said, wrong. You get the Spirit because you hear the Word of God and you believe that faith that, you, that God grants to you, that, that sweet gift of salvation comes to you. And God says, you're going to need some help. Let me give you my Holy Ghost. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll comfort you. What does it say? He'll bring to your remembrance all that Christ has what? Has said to you. Those things when you forget a verse and, you, and, you're, and you're with a friend and all of a sudden, has anyone ever experienced this where all of a sudden you quoted the verse and you didn't even know you knew it? It just like came out. Blah, 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 and you're like, whoa, I, I'm not really that good at paying attention. I, how did I get that? That is the Holy Ghost. When people say to me, prove there's a God, I'm pretty sure I've learned a lot of verses that I didn't do on my own. It was God's Spirit reminding me, teaching me. Anyone can give an amen to that, that he does that for us? Amen? Well, let's go to Galatians 4 and now continue this thought. Paul says that all of these things that were given in the law were just to teach us, a tutor. A tutor that would teach us we have sin, and now that we know we have sin, the tutor says you need a solution to that sin, and that solution is Christ. And Christ was the promise of faith, one that was given, by the way, before the Ten Commandments to Moses, the promise was given to Abraham that through his seed, singular, not plural, what seed is he talking about? What seed would come? That stone that the builders rejected? Jesus. That seed would come. And this is this why your New Testament starts in Matthew with the genealogy of Jesus. From Abraham to Isaac. To Je why did they have to prove that? They didn't start with Moses, by the way. Did you notice that in the beginning of your New Testament? They didn't say, let's start at Moses and go down line. They started from before Moses. Because it had from the beginning, right? From Adam's sin all the way to Abraham's promise of redemption all the way to David all the way to the New Testament covenant made by Jesus. These things were given so that we could become adopted into God's family. Now that's what Paul ended with last week in Galatians chapter 3. He said, don't you know that you are now heirs in the kingdom of God? You, it doesn't matter if male, female, slave, free, bond. It, to the Lord, is there any discrepancy or any um, discrimination according to race or gender or and yet no we are all if verse 29 the last verse of galatians 3 says if you belong to christ then you are abraham's offspring you are heirs according to that promise that first that covenant that god made with abraham you know abraham it says believe god and god reckoned it to him as righteousness god was pleased with this man because he just believed. We don't need to make the gospel so com complicated. It just comes down to a simple thing. God wants to give you a gift. Do you, do you want it? All you have to do is what? Re take it. Receive it. Now, let me tell you, Paul goes on and explains some of the subtleties of this. And he had to because there was some guys creeping and doing some bad stuff to this church. Galatians 4 verse 1 reads, now, I say, as long as the heir is a child, he doesn't differ at all from the slave, although he's actually the owner of everything. He's, you know, when, when you could be the, the son of the king, but as long as you're a child, well, he says in verse 2, as, lo he, as long as he's under the, the guardians and managers, or, or the old King James says the tutors and the governors. That, so those of you that are familiar with those terms, you know, they're basically under guardianship by someone looking after them when they're children. They're not considered um, ready to manage all the stuff that dad is in charge of because 
they have to grow and come to that place when when the date is set that they'll then have it transferred over to them well verse 3 says so also we while we were children were held in bondage under this elemental things of the world but but when the fullness of time came God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law in order that he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons and because we are now sons God sent forth his what his spirit the spirit of his son into our hearts crying Abba father now if you're not familiar with with Hebrew Abba in Hebrew is one of the first words that most kids learn it's Abba is uh, Dada we would say in English it's not daddy it's Dada Dada Abba that's the word the Hebrew word for father but it's a personal you know it's what a child calls his father or her her father it's very you know it's not not just a dad a father no it's my dad mine you, you ever seen how possessive kids can be when it comes to their parents mine my dad my mine my mine some other kid comes and sits in mom's lap they're like get out of here shove them off that's my dad my mom get off you know do do they have to actually be taught this no they just do it now this is one of the sweetest things maybe you don't have a good relation with your earthly parents but let me tell you, when it comes to the things of the gospel, this is one of the sweetest parts I found that, you know, some people, they didn't, maybe they're orphaned and they, they didn't even know their parents. Let me tell you, you have a heavenly father that you get to call Dada, Abba, your father. He's saying, I'll be your dad. And Paul says, this is one of the things that happens when we come to faith in this covenant. We get to be sons heirs you know and i have to tell you personally i appreciate this maybe more than some but i grew up in a kind of poor poor family we were middle class till my parents divorced my mom went on and remarried and i've told you the story five different guys and um you know five divorces and the one problem with this is how much financial destruction does a divorce do to to family's wealth what they were uh, <laughs> Just ask Mark, he'll tell you. Um, the, the reality is it can be one of the most, un, I mean, what you can spend a lifetime working together to accumulate can be destroyed and given to lawyers in, uh, I don't know, one fell swoop of a pen. It's amazing. It's just, it's ridiculous. But when you experience it multiple times over and over and over, you basically get down to where you have nothing. Everything gets lost and and the things that you had hoped for as a child that you would inherit because that was your dad's and it was supposed to be passed down to you. My uncle David, uh, my middle name is David. Um, my uncle fought in our armed services and uh, he was killed on a, flung off the end of an aircraft carrier. That's what we were told. They did say training extra. They can't tell you anyway when they're doing stuff. So, so I was supposed to get his, his Navy sword. You know, it was a big deal presented with the flag to my mother at Arlington and and um, the sword hung above our mantle f for well we didn't have a fireplace but just over the where uh, in the living room prominently displayed as I was a young child and I was told your ni your middle name remember your uncle Dave I was the only one that remembered him I was all old enough you know he died when I was like seven years old I think six seven years old my other brothers just don't even remember him they said and and there's a picture of me with him and there's a picture of the, and there's the sword they, when he was dressed in full dress you know all to the nines with the with his military uh uniform on and and he had that sword and and i was told that's going to be yours someday you know you're named after him that's going to be um, something to remember him so my whole life you know growing up i thought that's going to be mine that's going to be mine and then um, a few divorces down the road somehow that thing went to a pawn shop and disappeared never to be it, uh, you know it was gone without me ever getting a chance to even know that it was gone and um i remember in my heart i just thought i hate i hate divorce i'm starting to hate that i i didn't pick this family you know god i got a beef i'm bone to pick with you you know why couldn't you been let me be married in or born into a family what had it together 
And they didn't have divorce. And, you know, that did, at least I had got my uncle's sword that I could have been like just a, rem, a, a you know, reminder, like a connect. Because that, that was something promised to me as an heirloom. You know, part of just being an heir in my family, that was to come to me. No, it's not that, it's not for monetary value or anything, but it, it's, it's sentimental. Have any of you ever been promised something what is sentimentally valuable to you and someone else took it or got it? And I hate to say this, but sometimes it's usually a sibling, you know, or a family member that stole it or somehow connived it. Or, and you're like, how, how does it make you feel when you lose what your inheritance, what was promised to you? Empty, right? Angry? It stinks. And I personally think it's because Within us, there is a wiring where, where what, for, what, let me just explain this. If, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, when the Jews came into the land, what God promised them, he told them that you, will, I will bless you. You follow me, I will bless you. I will give you houses which you have not built to live in. I will give you trees to sit under and eat of the fig and the fruit of those trees which you didn't even plant. I will give you an inheritance from me, says the Lord. Now, that inheritance to a Jew that was given to them, you know, the, the tribe of Gad or, 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 or all the different tribes of the 12 tribes were actually apportioned different parts. of. If you look at one of the Old Testament maps, you'll see that there's little areas designated territories for each of the tribes. Here's my question. Those of you that know the Old Testament customs and laws, were they allowed to give away their land to a... Uh, a non-Jewish person. or to, By the way, to anyone outside their, not even outside their family, right? It was supposed to be something you passed on as an inheritance. You could, you, you, you could only lease it out if you got into financial trouble. But then came this thing called the year of Jubilee. Every 49 years, seven sevens, they'd have the 50th year, this year of Jubilee. And all debts are forgiven. All land goes back to who? Original owner. You get to keep your heritage. Your, what you were promised, you, you know, what you were born into, that's supposed to be passed on to you. Now, God set that up for, for the Jewish people. Everything he set up for them, he said, was for who exam whose example? Ours. Were we wired where it's, it, well, you guys that know the Proverbs say, it is a, is a disgrace for a man not to leave an inheritance to his children. Some people get, they look at me and say, why are you so angry at that in the traffic right now? I say, you see that bumper sticker in front of me? It says, we're spending our children's inheritance. We're not leaving them a dime. How good does that make that child feel, of those people? I know some people mean it as a joke and all in fun, but some do not. They're flat out, I'm not leaving my kids nothing. In the, in the book of Proverbs, it says that's a disgrace to a man to not leave a, a, an inheritance to his children. It's a disgrace. You, you, God gave you a duty to take and raise your children up in the fear of the Lord and to look after them to the best of your ability. Even if what you leave them is just a small thing, a, a, a sentimental thing. If I say, son, Daniel, this is my most important thing, this book. When I die, this is yours. Okay? <laughs> he says, I got it on video. <laughs> This book has the wisdom to point me to Jesus. Jesus is the one that gives me everlasting life. What more valuable possession could I pass on to my son? I mean, what will I have of the stuff, the material stuff? That's just stuff. And stuff can divide families. I've seen families fight over things when a you know mom, dad pass away and... The kids went from getting along so good to now they're at war because one of them wants a china cabinet and the other one, no, they want it and they're going to fight over it. And It's just stuff. We can't take it with us. But it is something that there's a part of us inside that those things, what, what our parents pass on to us, they mean something to us. It's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a sweet knowledge it's a comfort to us to know i my parents included me in their will you know i'm 
they want to leave something to me, even if it's a small thing. I've seen some of the most cherished things that have been passed on not be big monetary gifts, but, but rather the littlest of things that the mom says to the daughter, I want you to have this ring, what my grandmother gave me, that her grandmother gave her. I've, I've worn this my whole life on my little finger, and this is going to be yours when I go. And that little, just a little, uh, let me tell you, the old jewelry is not sometimes the most valuable or the most, but is it precious to the person? That's called an inheritance. Let me tell you something. When you're a Christian, a believer in the gift what God gave of his son, you now are adopted into God's family. You're now going to be an heir. Now, this is the part I got to tell you I'm very excited about because... When I used to complain <clears throat> a little about this to the Lord, I w sh should I tell you that I did that? By the way, it's scriptural. Don't worry. You read it. Psalm 55. I think that's the right psalm. Let me look on the right side of my page here. Psalm 55. Evening and morning and at noon, I complained and murmured unto the Lord, and he what? Heard my cry, and he answered okay why does it start evening morning and noon psalm 55 here starting in verse 16 as for me i will call upon the lord and the lord will save me verse 17 that's the verse i just quoted you psalm 55 verse evening morning and noon now in the jewish calendar their culture the next day begins when the sun sets not when the sun rises. They measure the day from sunset through the night to the morning to the noon back to the next sunset one day. That's why when you read the book of Genesis, there was darkness upon the face of the earth. God made the light. There was dark, then light, one day. The dark was first, the night, then the day, light, then back to the night. So the Jewish calendar is measured a little different than ours. But basically it's saying this. Evening, morning, and noon, you get to complain and murmur. Or it's equivalent of, we'd say, morning, noon, and night if you want to do it Western culture style. But who do you complain and murmur to? Not the pastor. <laughs> Shame on you for even suggesting that. The pastor's shoulders are not big enough to handle all your complaints. And, and, he, and he, yeah, they think that, that if it says pastor, it, it, I don't know if it just magically has like, do you remember those little things in the, in the cracker box, cracker jacks, and, and you turn the little piece of lens and, and you look this way and you see one word and then they tilt it a little and another word appears. And they had those like hidden words that you just tilt it a little. Who knows what I'm talking about? Some of you looking at me really weird. Or kids, they really were these little plastic things with it and a little lens and you tilt it. Some people think the pastor... On the door has one of those that they look this way. It says, complaint department, pastor, complaint department, pastor. Yeah, that's what, no. The only complaint department open 24 hours a day with a guy who can actually do something about your problem is the Lord. That's who we're here to magnify. This is, that's who we're here to point you to. You got a problem. Morning, noon, night, evening, morning, noon, if you're from the Middle East, all day long, you can go to God. And you can complain and murmur to him and he will hear your cry. And he will, what does the psalmist say? He'll answer. Man, I love that you can go to the Lord. If I teach you nothing else this morning, but that, that if you have a problem, I teach you where to take it and get an answer. Am I doing my job as a pastor? That's what I need to do is teach people where to go with their problems. Go to the Lord. Paul says, and the Lord will give you his spirit. And his spirit will help you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He really does. How many give an amen that God's spirit has led you in things through your life? You, you can say amen to that. Amen? There are times when we don't know what to do. And we're just like, God, I need you to direct me. And he has so many different ways he can direct us. I mean, from making a light turn red right when we were thinking we're going to go straight. And he was sitting, we're sitting there waiting. What's it taking so long for? What's it taking so long for? And then someone just appears on the sidewalk. Could I get a ride? And God's going, I just needed you to stop long enough to pay attention. A divine appointment. You're going to pick them up and just give them a ride. And you don't even realize 
that God is setting you up for something that he wants to sh use you to share his love or mercy to somebody. Just just a ride, and it turns out that was the ride they needed to get to get to their job interview on time, and they were and they and they were out uh, a, a, a way to get there a vehicle, and you were like an angel sent from God. And they get the job because you just had to be patient for a minute at the light. Sometimes God directs us a simple little thing like that, and we don't even realize His Spirit is at work. We need to go back to those things of the early church where they recognized they only got to experience all these wonderful things because well, it was all new to them. It was, it was fresh. It was exciting. Man, God's Spirit did this. You know, the young man was praying and the Lord directed him, go out to the desert road. And he went out to the desert road. Remember this in the book of Acts? One of my favorite stories. He gets there and, and there's an Ethiopian eunuch traveling by with his whole caravan. and He's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. That portion that says in Isaiah 52 and 53, like a sheep, what is led before shearers is silent. He opens not his mouth. In humiliation, he goes. He, by his stripes, we are, we are what? Healed. The chastening of our well-being, of our peace, fell upon him. He's reading this, this Ethiopian eunuch. And, you know, by the way, for him to, you know this was a man of, of power, wealth. Because first of all, he has, he has a, obtained a writ. Back then, all of the books of the Old Testament scriptures were handwritten on scrolls. Very, very costly to obtain. And he's got the entire scroll of Isaiah. That's a big deal. And he's, in the Jewish culture, by the way, the, the, the scroll of Isaiah, the 66 chapters we call, uh, what it's broke down to today, is called the Miniature Bible. The whole plan of salvation from man's fall into sin to God's redemption is all expressed in this one book. It's like an overview of the entire Bible. And he's reading it and he's going, who's this guy talking about that he's going to be beaten, bruised for our iniquities? You know, who is, 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 is the prophet Isaiah talking about himself? And he's pondering these things. And here comes this kid. This kid who God had directed you Go out to the road. You, see the caravan? Go up and, and join yourself to the caravan. Now, I love this story. I can't, when we get to heaven, I, I call dibs first on the, on the replay screen, okay? Because I'm going to say, Lord, could you put the part up with Philip? I can just see him running along. Do you know what you're reading? And he's, you know, he, the guy's traveling along, and he's, he goes, how could I unless someone explained it? And it says, and from that, ver I, could, I could help you out there. I know that part. And he invited him up into his chariot. And from that very verse, he explained to him that Jesus was the one that came. He was the one who took away our humiliation. He's the one who paid for our sin. He's the one who made it so we could have everlasting life. And, and the man says, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And what was Philip's answer? Those of you who are Bible students, you can help out this one. Nothing as long as you what? Believe. He didn't say nothing as long as you keep the Ten Commandments. Nothing as long as you do the law. No, nothing as long as you believe. And so he takes it down there. He baptizes him. As soon as he baptized him, what happened to Philip? It says he was translated, snatched up, by, caught up by God, and put down in a place called Azatos, uh, one of the little small cities of the region but if you follow south of Jerusalem the desert road the only place where there's a brook of water it's pretty far away from Jerusalem and down in a valley and Azatos the closest that Azatos to any bend in that brook is over 20 miles that's the closest I'm not saying they could have been well down the road by the time they finished this thing they could be 40, 50 miles away. It doesn't really matter anyway. I'm the one asking when we get there. Because I got a, I got a question for Philip. It says, the Lord picked him up and the Ethiopian eunuch saw him no more. He just vanished. So the eunuch, he came to faith and there went the guy. He's, the preacher's gone. And he says he went, continued on his way. By the way, historically, do we have any 
history of Christianity reaching Ethiopia. What's that? The Coptic Church is huge. Yes. There's, there's a lot of Ethiopian Christians. Do we have any record of the apostles going to Ethiopia? Any of the early church members? No. But we do have a record of one of the waiters. One of the waiters with a Greek name who had to take care of the Hellenistic Jews that were being overlooked in the serving, uh, um, and the Hellenistic widows, I'm sorry, not Jews, Hellenistic widows, that means the, the Greek widows in the early church that weren't being, they were getting overlooked when it came time for serving the food. And they said, find a seven young men full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. There was qualifications just to be a waiter in the church. These guys, and put them in charge of feeding these Greek widows. And Philip, one of those seven young men, gets sent down there, right? And then the Lord snatches him up, puts him down in Azotus, and the Bible says he went right on preaching. I don't know about you, but what did you do? I mean, you just like, you baptize the guy, and all of a sudden, poof, you're gone, and poof, you're here. You'd be like, whoa. Now, my, this is why I want to ask him. I'm going to ask Philip right away. So when you were snatched up and put down in Azotus, did the Lord dry clean you on the way? Or did you just land in the middle of the square and you were dripping wet from the river? You know, like, I watched a lot of Star Trek. Sorry, it's beam me up Scotty thing, you know. Because if they beamed them out of the mud or whatever, when they landed on the transporter pad, they, the mud came with them, right? I want to know, Philip, did you, did you just pop up wet and they went, where'd you come from? It says he went right on preaching. He would become one of the early evangelists in the church. And the gospel would go all the way to Ethiopia because that young man, that young man had one divine appointment that he listened when God told him to do one little thing. Just go down to that road. If God told you to do a little thing, just go over here. Jan, I need you to stop by Ross today after church. Just, just go. Oh, she says thanks. <laughs> My wife said she'll go with her. Both Jans are going to Ross. <laughs> but it's not for the shopping. It's for a soul. It would it be worth? No, if the Lord does, the Lord send us on appointments. Have any of you experienced what what you can look back and see that was a divine appointment by God, where He sent you to be the person right there at that right time to intersect with another life. We don't realize what a great... I think the Lord has been diminished in American preaching. He has, he has become somehow less of the God that he is because our small minds have put too much emphasis on us, our works. We do it for God. Baloney, God does it despite us. Let's get it right. In spite of ourselves and our puniness and our stupid mistakes, he still manages to use us, and that's how he gets the glory. And people look and go, wow, God could use Izzy. There's got to be a God. And that's a good thing. We have to be humble enough to acknowledge that. And say, you know what? Really, the glory goes to him. He's the giver of the gifts. He's the one who did it. Let's keep the focus where it belongs, on him. Do you think more people would come to Jesus if the preachers in America would put the attention back on Jesus? I mean, this is an admonishment, by the way, to all pastors. You better not be preaching messages that take people away from our Lord. The focus is Him. It doesn't, using analogies, what He's worked in your life, that's great. That's your testimony. But where's the, where's the attention to go to? Where are we directing people? To Jesus. One way. I just saw that movie, Woodlawn, what is about the, the Christian movement that happened in the 70s 73 when they tried to integrate the, the 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 black kids with the white kids in uh in the south and there was a there was a movement the lord did we, we it's referred to in our uh, annals as the jesus people movement that jesus thing and and the and the kids all said this symbol is what counts and what was this one way jesus said i am the way the truth the life and no one gets to the Father except through me. We're here to point he's the way. Look to him. And he's a big guy. And did you know he wants you to be his child? And did you know you get to inherit? Oh, oh, inherit. You are an heir 
Which means now my greatest objection I've had with God my whole life was taken away. God, why'd you let me be born in this messed up family? Couldn't I have been born in the Rockefellers? Or I, couldn't I have been Bill Gates' only kid? Or could I, you know, get, I didn't choose which family I was born into. And I used to always be bummed because I'm not going to get much of an inheritance from my family. But now that I'm in God's family, how big is my inheritance? Everlasting life. And everything, Jesus said, everything. You, you give a cup of water to a little one in his name. Jesus said, it's like you did it unto who? Unto him. And he says, he will reward you. Every divine appointment you walk in, where you give someone some food. This morning we give the food. Some people say, what's the catch? What do you want? I said, I want treasure in heaven. Please take. And they think I'm... Like, th there's a catch. I'm like, this, no, I, God's real. I'm doing this as my service to him. And, and if you just freely take it, that would be great. Because everything I give in his name, I'm doing it, un, uh, you know, as my service unto him. And he says he sees it and he'll reward me. And he told me in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, in my Bible, I had those words of Christ in red. You know, it's a great, if you ever get an opportunity to give a Bible that has that uh, feature where they've changed the color of the ink. It's, um, it's kind of cool because all the stuff what Jesus said pops off the page already. It's like highlighted. And it says in Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus, he, he, he spoke to these guys. And he told them, just seek his kingdom, his righteousness. How many things get added to you? All the things. And he goes on and he tells his disciples, you guys, what, whatever you will do later in the book of Matthew, say whatever you did to the least of my brethren... He did it unto what? Unto me. And in Matthew 6, he'll say, he'll say these words. Store up your treasure not on earth, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But store instead up your treasures where? In heaven. For where your treasure is, that's where, what, where's going to be? Your heart. Are we wired for treasure? I asked the kids that this week on Friday night. Are we wired for treasure? And they, they kind of, well, I don't know. I said, well, you know, if I had a gold brick here, or I had the latest, you know, iPhone 6S, 7, hasn't even got to the market yet. How valuable, you know, the kids are, ooh, I want one. We are wired for treasure. But whatever our treasure is, our heart gets attached to it. And Jesus knows we need our heart attached to the things of heaven. Because those things, they last for how long? You said it, forever. That's treasure nobody gets to take away from us. And I tell you, as disappointing as I've experienced some of the losses, that, that Navy sword, that got taken away down here, but I couldn't have taken it with me anyway. But everything I have done in my service unto the Lord, you know, those things what I will receive a reward for, nobody's taking that from me. That is going to be my, you know, the Lord's going to give it to us. And those things, there's something, it, it's like, it's like the speaker that came to speak to us at the food bank, the, the governor sent one of his aides to come talk to us this week. And they addressed all of the different ministries that do the feedings. And the, and the, the man who shared was a, a Wally, he, I can't think of his last name, he's one of the guys on the governor's board here. He said that when he was young, he was taught the Hawaiian thing is there, there is the, the pono thing to do. Pono in Hawaiian is the right thing. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And he says, and for some reason, even if you don't believe in a God, you don't believe in anything, there is a code of his parents taught him, which you could tell that he believed in God, but he was just explaining, even if you don't, it is wrong to not treat your fellow human with enough respect if they're hungry and they're hurting the pono thing to do is at least give them something to eat give them a shirt to wear get you know, clothe them feed them now what did jesus say when i was hungry you fed me when i was thirsty you gave me to drink when i was naked you clothed me when i was sick or in prison you visited me and they said when did we do that to you he said when you did it to the least 
of my brethren. He did it to me. Guys, I'm, I'm spiritually greedy. I am going for as much treasure as I can get. And I'm hopefully stirring you up to do the same. I'm supposed to. The Bible says stimulate you to love. Provoke, the old King James says. Provoke one another to love and to good deeds. I'm here to get you to do that. Let's fill up those boxes for Samaritan's Purse. Let's fill up tons of boxes. Let's get, let, let's get the gospel out. And, and just do the right thing. And let's not worry about what we don't inherit here. Because what you have that's waiting for you, nobody's taken. And it's a good feeling. When you realize you get everlasting life. But it's not just everlasting life. You get an inheritance from the richest sugar daddy there is. I mean, we're talking like blows away anybody down here. He owns how much? All the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. When he gives out his inheritance, let me tell you, that's the family to be adopted into. And all of you that believe in Jesus, raise your hand. You're in that family. You are going to get that inheritance. I want you to go in that knowledge today. That your inheritance isn't here. It's there. And it will never be taken away from you. And may that give you a, an anchor. A, you know, something strong, stability in your faith. That you don't get swayed by this stupid little stuff down here. Because you know the real stuff. The eternal stuff is waiting for you up there. Some of you, you just can't wait to go up there just to be with some of your loved ones. Anyone here? can relate to that someday you're going to be like i get to see my grandma i get to see my 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 folks i get to see my brother or sister or or that dear person that died that you have such an influence on your life guys all of that is part of our inheritance that's what we get to look forward to now next week we'll, we'll continue this there's a lot of chapter four of galatians so just please read ahead We'll continue on in our, in, our, in our study through the scriptures. Remember, Tuesday night be, well, just pray for me tomorrow morning at 7 when I go to the, to, to the dentist, uh, Dr. Hir Hiranaka. Pray for him. He does good. <laughs> and they can put me out. So. And pray I wake up because last time they put me under for my hernia surgery, they had a hard time waking me up. The nurse was like, wake up, wake up, wake up. And I was like, what is wrong with it? She kept saying, breathe. I'm thinking I do that naturally. You know, but I guess I didn't because she kept yelling at me, breathe, breathe. And thankfully she was a Christian lady and she stuck with it until I finally, you know, like two hours later started breathing on my own. But she said for two hours she had to do that. And um, my wife was wondering, why is it taking him so long? And they tell me, you're a lightweight. You, you don't use any drugs, do you? I'm like, no. They like, we can tell, <laughs> you know. I didn't know. I mean, like, I don't usually practice, you know, anesthesia or anything for fun cheapers but um you know we'll see we'll see how it goes you wake up early when it happens i don't i don't want to wake up early i'd like to just wake up done so um so keep me in your prayers tomorrow morning i have covet your prayers i covet even more your prayers that what dylan does will be able to Im let us help the people who need to hear the gospel in other places and uh please keep that in your prayers too because i know Usually when that stuff happens, more people get touched. And what happens to the pastor and all the people close to him? Fall out. Pow. So we'll be praying. And, uh, and let keep, let's, be, let's be that church that's strong in prayer. You know, I was greeted by a man this morning. He said that um, his opinion was that there shouldn't be prayer allowed in churches. Is that right? Right over here where, where Dick is sitting telling me. Uh, no, actually, there's one chair back right, right where you guys are over there. He's saying that they should not allow prayer in church. And uh, I said, you need to go somewhere else. No, I didn't. I thought that. He, um, he was sincere. He really thought that you're not supposed to have prayer in churches. I was like, what are you talking about? And one of those people, get rid of prayer everywhere. Oh, by the way, did anyone see the thing that they are allowing prayer back in one of the states on the mainland for in the schools? Prayer has been legalized. I'm like, please, Lord, let it continue. By the way, if they think that they could get rid of prayer in school, they'd have to get rid of testing. Because every time you all give a test, the kid's going to pray anyway. Oh, God, help me. I don't know what the answer to number six is, you know. I mean, 
if they want to get rid of prayer in school, just quit giving tests. And uh, you might you might get away with that. But they ain't going to get away with that as long as there's testing allowed. So so don't worry about it. But, but we do need to return to the Lord and seek the Lord as a nation. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.